We are excited to have our 2021 to 22 fellows here to present their projects today. Each of them will just be going over the resource that they built. Um, these are not all immediately available right now. So over the next few weeks, we will be releasing them. And I will send out an email to everybody who has registered for this session to all the resources once they are publicly available. In addition, for those who are just coming in right now, if you have questions while the presenters are talking, please put it in the Google Doc, and that way your questions will be documented for everybody who is here today and who are going to be looking at this doc later. And I will actually document their answers as well so that this information is available to everybody um, who would like to access it in the future. So a little bit about the RJI Fellowship Program. Uh, we are an eight month program where we support fellows from all over the country in projects that help build positive and useful resources for journalism. So they build tools, toolkits, guides, programs. Um, they create things that serve a need or gap or challenge in journalism today. So we are a very impact focused fellowship program. We build resources and um, all of these resources will be available to you once they are officially launched by our fellows. So we're very excited to share them today. And then after everybody has shared, we will take questions. Um, the one caveat to that is that Yukari will be sharing first because she has to duck out. So we will let her share, answer a few questions, um, and then we will go through all the other fellows and have more Q&A at the end. So Yukari, why don't you take it away? Right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yukari Kane, and I'm a co-executive director and co-founder of Prison Journalism Project, where we train incarcerated writers in the tools of journalism and we publish their stories. Um, I applied for RJI uh, with the intention of creating a collaborative framework for um, outside journalists and newsrooms to work with incarcerated writers uh, and journalists inside um, stories that can be uh, covered from both sides of the wall. And uh, one of the things that I discovered fairly soon into my fellowship was that um, there was so much appetite and interest in collaborative work, but there were a lot of um, logistical challenges and just um, uh, a lot of gaps in, in knowledge of how to work with people who are literally um, closed off. And, and so um, the, the project that I ultimately tackled at, uh, with through my fellowship was to create a toolkit um, with the resources that we've created uh, over the two years that we've been doing this and, um, and, and other tools that, that, we, that we wanted to, uh, we thought would be helpful for outside reporters who are you know, maybe doing this on a freelance basis, on a one-off basis, and as well as newsrooms who wanted to, uh, to do this more consistently as well. And so I am going to share my screen. So this is, um, the Prison Journalism Toolkit. And um, I've come up with a few starter sections and, and we hope to keep building on this. Um, but uh, the idea was, was that we get a lot of inquiries all the time from newsrooms and freelance writers who want to work with us, uh, with our writers, and we just don't have the ability to tackle them all. And so this would be providing a lot of the tools so, so they could do it. They could uh, forge ahead on their stories themselves. Um, the initial components is uh, a primer on communicating with prison journalists, and so I'll show you that. Um, so this is uh, just a, uh, a primer on, on how mail works, uh, digital messages work, and phone calls work. There's a lot of learnings that, that we've accumulated over time about the different intricacies and the rules and regulations of, of how um, the system works and how you can um, connect with incarcerated people. And, and the bottom line is, is, is leave plenty of room uh, for communications. Um, this next tool is something that, uh, that's the same one, let me see here. Um, so this is, this is um, a version of a guide that we developed for ourselves inside, but every state has, a, has different rules and regulations for how to communicate with people inside. And so if you click on, on each of the states, there's a drop down with the, the most important rules and regulations um, for connecting with them. There's also um, 
uh, a closed loop email system and, and phone systems, but every state is it uses a different system. And so it tells you where to go. Um, so this is, um, this is meant to be just a really practical, uh, useful, useful uh, guide. Um, the next section is, uh, this is a reporter's glossary of prison jargon. Um, if you are not communicating with um, people inside, if you are reading their stories or contributions or memos, you're gonna see a lot of jargon. Some of it is um, just shorthand. Um, others are uh, words that they use to keep, to hide meaning from, from um, an administration and officers. And, and one of the um, things that I think makes this unique from others that are out there is one, it was written with, uh, compiled with journalists in mind. And two, um, there were 15 writers who contributed from, uh, let's see, 10 states across the country. And so we think it's the, um, uh, something that was put together with the most number of, of contrib contributions. And so this is um, divided into categories um, and you can just drop down and, and it's hopefully pretty easy to understand. This is going to be a work in progress. So if you see anything um, that, that is wrong with it or any additions, modifications, um, I would love to know. One of my favorite uh, words was, um, was, uh, in, in prison commissaries, there are apparently items that are free, uh, masks, um, soaps, things like that in, in some locations and they call it Obamacare. So um, there's some, there's some uh, fascinating words in here. Um, and then finally, uh, there is a section on safety of staff. And so uh, these are just, this is a copy of our policy and some of the thinking that we've done about this. Um, of course, even more important is the safety of our writers and journalists. And that's something that we're working on right now um, with uh, the Global Press Institute. And uh, once we uh, figure out what we, um, our policies and protocols and procedures around that, we intend to share that as well. Um, so, uh, those are the initial components. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, some of the things that I'd like to add to it uh, later this year is um, one is around the language of incarceration, something that we've done a lot of work on. Um, it just, um, one of the things that we have found was that people inside are not, um, have not thought about this um, not everybody has thought about this. And so we wanted to create a handout to explain um, uh, you know, kind of a guide to help them think through what are the words that they would like to use for themselves? What are the words that they would like other, uh, the media to adopt? Um, and, then, and then come out with something, a guidance based on what they would like. Uh, and, um, and then we also hope to have um, a resource guide for, for um, key data and, uh, and research firms and groups and, and that, are, that are doing work in this space just as a, as a starting point. So that is it. Thank you. All right, you do have a question. Um, lots of things to digest. Yes, yes, I'm going to be taking notes um, on the presentation and then each of the things that the fellows are presenting today, these will be shared out um, in the coming weeks as resources for everyone to use. So. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is still uh, this is still not live on our site. We're at uh, prisonjournalismproject.org, uh, but it will be uh, an item under our special projects section. And so, uh, once the RJR article is out, um, it should be widely available. And so, one of your questions is: When it comes to the glossary of words, um, do you fear that the guards will read it and that your sources will face repercussions for it? Um, I, you know, we, that was a consideration that one of our writers had, um, what we haven't, I guess the short answer is that we haven't used all of the words, um, because we wanted to, uh, keep it to words that would come up in journalism that might come up in journalism that are relevant, um, uh, to reporters. And so, um, I think a lot of those words we probably ended up excluding. And the ones that we did were words that came up several times by a number of our writers. And so it's nothing that was, uh, particular to that institution. Um, I also looked at other glossaries that were out there, and I think that uh, there's a little bit of, you know, um, 
I'm sure that there are words that are not known by the guards and administrators, but uh, there's probably more that are known than, than uh, they might think. Okay, and uh, another question is, have you done any work around victim advocacy? I'm currently working with youth who are currently or formerly incarcerated to make radio stories. I'm reading it as they're typing. And I've been wondering <laughs> how to do right by the community members who have experienced harm. Um, we have not worked with victims' rights groups. I mean, our, our mission is very specifically the training of uh, incarcerated people in the tools of journalism and publishing their stories. However, um, a lot of them have written about, um, you know, have reflected on their crimes, have reflected on, on the impact that that's had and the transformations. And so we, you know, we, we want our writers to, to get that across. Um, one of the things that we do have is an editorial policy where we're very specific about, you know, not publishing stories stories that uh, re-victimize individuals, not publishing stories, um, not even publishing stories about their crimes. Um, it just because, partly because we don't have the, um, the, the resources to do the investigative reporting that would be necessary to fact check it properly. And so uh, we are careful about what they're, what we're publishing from them um, and uh, cognizant that, you know, crimes have victims, but, um, you know, we don't directly work with them. All right, thank you so much, Yukari. If anyone else thank has you. more questions for her, please add them to the doc and she will get to look at them later. Um, and next, Emma, why don't you tell us a little bit about your project? Hi, I'm Emma Kurogorvam. I uh, put together a small leadership pilot program for journalists of color, and I'm gonna um, talk you through that. So kind of the big picture vision here is what might journalism look like if a generation of journalists of color were ready to lead? And my solution here is called Upward, and this is what I spent my fellowship working on. Um, Upward is a six month group, small group coaching and individual coaching effort for journalists of color who work in local news. Candidates get support from their cohort of fellows, their coach, their direct manager, and their executive sponsor. So it's important that the newsroom puts some resources into this agreement. Um, and the program prepares these journalists of color with leadership skills so they can apply immediately to their current roles while also developing longer term goals and plans for themselves and their newsrooms. So it's a leadership accelerator for journalists of color working in newsrooms. This year we had six journalists of color nominated from six local newsrooms. Two came from newspapers, two from public radio, one came from a TV station, and one came from an online startup. Three were newly minted as leaders in their companies, which meant that they had started a new or expanded role in roughly the past six months. One changed jobs during the course of the program and decided to leave journalism for a comms role in higher ed. And two are still currently eyeing positions of change in the next year. One has a pretty firm commitment from her employer while the other is still exploring what that looks like. Uh, these are just a little bit about how they describe their own growth that they were able to use ideas uh, from our training, from our, our group coaching sessions to um, bring in new applicants to a job they're hiring for. Uh, another one of the fellows is going to be looking for some training boot camps that she can pursue while she's doing her MBA. And of course, I also asked their managers uh, what they saw and how they've seen their fellows grow since uh, they've been part of the Upward program. And so more decisive about news decisions, uh, become more organized around her weekly meetings and understanding the value of her own voice, which I count as really lovely outcomes. Um, for this, because how did you grow as a leader is a really hard to measure uh, tangibly, but these I think are some really nice indicators that um, it's working. So the, uh, the newsrooms that we are working with, the, they're all local. Any size of newsroom was eligible, but had to have enough folks in the room to staff and support an emerging leader for roughly six to 18 months. And any format was eligible um, from newspapers to you know online only to uh, public radio. So the ideal journalist was someone who was a newly minted manager or likely to be promoted in the next six to 18 months. Most had been in their publication about two to five years. They have an interest in remaining at the publication, right? This is largely a retention play for uh, the newsroom and leadership can see this person becoming a top leader at anyone's publication in the future. 
So the core team that supports these journalists is their coach, their direct manager, their executive sponsor, and the rest of the cohort. And so we're not only teaching journalists to become better leaders for tomorrow, we're also guiding people who are in management and executive roles today on how to better develop uh, channels of journalists of color. So we learned a lot because this was a pilot program. And so in Upward 2.0, the program will be somewhat expanded with more clearly defined outcomes and deliverables, such as adding a formal strengths finder assessment, um, adding an additional one-on-one -on -one meeting for the fellows, doing more um, to support the managers and sponsors throughout the program, and then um, going from three guest speakers to six guest speakers. We think that'll be um, really awesome. So Cece was our first guest speaker and she was amazing. And Hannah is going to be our next guest speaker and she is also going to be amazing. Uh, so we're super excited about the inner cohort uh, support there and very grateful. And so um, if you are interested in supporting Upward in any way, whether by nominating a newsroom or a candidate for a future program, uh, or if you have leads on funding, uh, we're happy to chat about that. This is my email and how to get a hold of me. Thanks. All right, so let's just go through each of the presentations and then I will come back and do the questions for each presenter to make sure we have time for everybody to share their projects. Uh, so CC, please go next. Yeah, all right, so I also have slides which I will share. Um, and as all of us were talking about, if you don't like Zoom, resizing your entire screen every time, uh, you have control over this, which was um, revolutionary to me when I discovered it. Okay, so I'm super excited to share um, my final project it is one part of all the work that I've been doing, supported by RJI this year as a part of the DI coalition. Um, which I'll give you a tiny bit of background about in a second as well. But the final project is a guide that is going to be out sometime in the next week, I'm guessing, called How to Turn Private Conversations into Public Resources Through Community Consent. Um, it is a lot of collective work. Um, I drafted the guide, uh, which I'll walk you through in a second, but it is based off of months of work that we've been doing in the DEI coalition itself. And so I'll share with you a little bit about that, uh, which is that the coalition uh, was launched um, in 2020 as something we wanted to build. And then the digital space for it became a Slack community that was launched last year on March 22nd. And we are almost at March 22nd again. Um, it is a group of people who are now nearly at a thousand members um, who are coming together, who care about journalism and who want to change our industry to be anti-racist, equitable, and just, um, and essentially just to make it better and that we want to take action to make it better. And some of the work that has been coming out in the last couple of months um, is these public resources that we've created from these private conversations. The Slack itself is an off the record space. That's the default. And if you wanna share something, you have to get explicit consent from someone. And so the fact that we can turn an entire conversation into a public resource, you may have seen some of these uh, coming out in the past year. One came out in January, one came out last month. Um, the first one is a published snapshot. Basically a whole conversation happened and then we synthesized it and shared all of the tips and insights online, specifically about how to build trust and being good allies to your colleagues of color if you are a manager. And then the other type is a living document. This is a Google Doc that we are still adding to. It was private just to the coalition before, but Amanda Hickman really led this process, turning it into a totally public version um, and doing all of the work to try to figure out who contributed what to that ongoing resource and how do we credit them? How do we continue to alert people that this is a public document inside of a lot of private documents in the DI coalition? Um, and I bring these two types of documents up because we walk you through both options in the guide if you wanna recreate these processes, right? Um, and so, Here's a little preview of the whole guide um, and what it looks like. I'm very excited about the design, as you can tell. Um, but uh, I'll share this with you uh, before I dive into the, each of the sections a little bit. 
which is that, you know, many times in our work as journalists and our work as people who work in the journalism industry, right, in both of those worlds, we have off the record conversations because it's uh, what allow people as human beings to be as honest as possible with each other. And then we learn a lot from it. And afterward, we realize like, hey, the broader community would also benefit from learning all the things we just learned. And so how do we uh, go about sharing that knowledge in a way that doesn't tear down trust with the people you just had your private conversation with and instead build it up? Um, centers consent, centers transparency, centers crediting when people are comfortable. And so this is all about um, sort of uh, guiding us through that process where we're valuing building trust the entire time. So the guide itself, um, you get a little like preview of all of the sections here on this piece. Uh, we have a literal checklist uh, by which I mean, um, you are encouraged to make a copy of the guide for yourself so you can literally write all over it um, and you can actually check things off as demonstrated in the screenshot. Um, and you can like, you know, write things that are unique to you because we also include a lot of these templates in which it's the email you can send or the DM you can send, however you communicate with your community. And you like literally plug your own stuff in, you can adapt the emails however you want. Um, and it gives you really tangible examples of the things we talk about in the checklist. Like there are three tiers of permission that we ask folks and we like name those in the template so you can use that, build off of it, adapt off of it. I also added this little mini checklist, which I find adorable, which is a condensed version of all the to-dos without the explanation that you can have on hand. Um, and uh, I'm really just excited for folks to be able to follow this and use it. And so, if you have any questions, put them in the doc that uh, Kat has shared in the chat. We're probably publishing this within a week. I feel pretty good about that. Um, and if you want to be a part of this as a part of the DI Coalition, super welcome that. You can join. Um, and uh, otherwise, I like really, I'm really looking forward to other Slack communities, other listservs, uh, newsrooms when you're having like um, information gathering slash trust building conversations with your communities just as sources like what can you take away from that that you can publish super excited for where this can go um and that's it for me all right thank you so much so yes put your questions in the doc and we will get to as many as we can when we're done and next up is hannah thanks kat um i'm really excited about cc's resource i know i will be using it in my newsroom um here we go. Um, okay, my name is Hannah Wise, and I, once this loads, my computer's been very slow today. Loading, there we go. Okay, I have built Disability Matters, a toolkit for newsrooms to better serve the disability community. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I currently work for McClatchy. I'm based in Kansas City. Um, I work with the Kansas City Star, the Wichita Eagle, and the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Previously, I worked with the New York Times and the Dallas Morning News. Um, I am most, most passionate about building communities in digital spaces and thinking about the future of sharing news. Um, I'm also a disabled journalist. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2015. Um, it is an autoimmune disease that affects your entire gastrointestinal system and often is something that comes with other complicating autoimmune conditions. Um, when I was diagnosed when I was 23, I didn't think too much of it, but in the years since, it has really profoundly shaped both my personal life and how I approach my career, um, both as an individual reporter and as a manager. Um, I've written extensively about my diagnosis, and I'm constantly working with other journalists to try and advocate to have more perspectives from the disability community in day-to-day -day news coverage, which is what led me to apply for the RJI Fellowship. Um, there are 61 million Americans living with a disability right now. And that is something that is going to change. We're only going to see more people with disabilities coming out of the pandemic. Um, long COVID is growing in numbers and it's being more commonly diagnosed. And that is something that as a society and as an industry, we're going to have to really grapple with. So I started to see that disabled people are regularly ignored by the media and by society. 
prior to the pandemic starting two years ago, very infrequently did you see a news story or a piece of art or culture that depicted somebody with a disability, but not centered around that they are disabled. We were not able to just exist as humans um, who also have this disability. Um, I should note a note about language that I use. I prefer to say disabled person rather than person with a disability. Um, this is something that's really been changing in the community to not use um, person first language, but to use identity first. Um, because my disability is something that is intrinsic to who I am. It is not separate at all. And I don't feel negatively about myself because of my diagnosis. Um, and one of the core tenets that I've shared with um, this program is that you should just ask your sources what they prefer. I think that came through with Yukari's presentation and it's something that I really wanna hammer home here. So. There is a lack of perspective being shared in the media and by our general culture. So that leads to people not being able to see themselves in all different ways of life and that we are not prioritizing the needs of this community in how we produce and present the news. So for journalism, this means that when we fail to represent disability, we are not accurately covering and informing our communities. We are full stop just not doing our jobs. Um, these perspectives on important issues are being left out. The pandemic has made that incredibly clear to the industry. And I'm so happy that I am seeing more and more people thinking about what does a return to office look like when someone is immunocompromised? What does someone, um, someone's needs around vaccines look like in our coverage? When we do not cover these perspectives, when we do not cover disabled people, stereotypes are perpetuated and systemic failures continue, which leads me to when our news products are inaccessible. That is just a continuation of those systemic failures. If you are developing a website, an app, a podcast, if you say that, oh, we'll, la we'll add some accessible features later, that's a failure. We should be thinking about accessibility as an integrated part of our workflow continuously. It is not one person's job. And so if we continue to kick it down the can or kick it down the road, excuse me, um, it's just never, we're never gonna get there. Um, these inaccessible news products limit our audience size. Remember, 61 million people, that's people who can subscribe to your news organization, who can get, be a member of your public radio station. There, you are leaving dollars on the table by ignoring this community. And if someone can't access the product, why are they compelled at all to view, listen, read, subscribe, give you anything? Um, which also leaves our news organizations open to potential lawsuits under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So my solution, which I would describe as a very 1.0 solution to this, is a toolkit that gives journalists context about disability history, culture, and common pitfalls to avoid. As I was thinking about applying for this fellowship, I talked with a lot of other journalists who are disabled and not, and asked like, what do you know about disability? And most of them said, I don't know a lot unless they had a personal connection with some form of disability or um, any sort of vague like interest in it. Otherwise, it's not something that we're talking about in schools, in newsrooms, and people feel uncomfortable talking about it. Um, people's health feels very private, and it doesn't have to be if you address some of these topics with humanity and compassion and a genuine curiosity. And I think that we saw a lot of these similar conversations and discomfort around race, around gender, around sexuality in media's past and still in our current day. So I have designed this primer also on accessibility basics that anyone in a newsroom can apply. I thought a lot about um, if you are the New York Times or the Washington Post, how many changes you could make to your overall workflow, to your CMS that would really improve some of these accessibility quandaries that we face. However, 
this fellowship is designed to produce a product that helps all journalists, all people in the industry, whether they're a student or whether they are one of the most funded news organizations in the world. So I focused more on the individual types of journalism that one might produce or the products. So written copy, um, adding alt text to images, um, making sure you have a transcription of your podcast, having a transcript and captions of your video that don't just include the pieces that are spoken, but also include the description of what's happening in the video. So my toolkit um, is a part of this larger movement. Um, I applied for this fellowship in late or in early late 2020, early 2021. And, and since then, we've already seen more journalists who are specifically asking questions and writing stories that address the needs of the disabled community. We are seeing news organizations like the New York Times hiring for roles that report on disability and are having editors that are in place and empowered to make their news products more accessible. Captions and transcripts are becoming an expectation for all forms of media. If teens on TikTok can regularly add captions to their posts, all news organizations can as well. Um, popular culture is depicting disability and not making that piece, that role only about the person's condition or their of medicine or a mobility aid. People are able to just exist on screen and in culture um, in ways that we didn't see even five years ago. And newsrooms are on the verge of becoming more flexible workplaces. One of the things that news organizations, I think, coming out of the pandemic to be can be doing to support their disabled journalists and their disabled staff members is to create a flexible workspace. Um, make sure that people can go to appointments easily, make sure that they don't feel pressured to be in a crowded office in the middle of cold and flu season. Um, and I am thrilled that over the course of the eight months that I've been working on this project that we're seeing some of these really positive changes. But we're not done yet. Um, you, Every person in our industry and in our world can, needs to be a part of making um, our coverage be more representative of this community and making our products more accessible. So I hope that once this um, toolkit is officially published into the world, that you'll share it with your news organization. And I, like you said, this is a 1.0 version and it's open to comment. So please add your suggestions, add your comments, make this a living document that we can keep building upon for years to come. And I am available for coaching and consulting and speaking. So you can contact me for rates and availability at my email. Um, I'm so excited to have this enter the world and I really appreciate the support of my cohort and um, from RJI for helping fund this effort. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Hannah. And again, if you have questions for Hannah, please put it in the doc. I see people are already doing that, so that's great. All right, and next up is Liz. I'm just sharing. There we go. Hopefully you can see my screen. Hi, I'm Liz Bloomfield. I'm the executive director of Ripple Effect Images. Um, so simply no words. Um, the project that we've been working on is focused on a collaborative approach to harnessing the power of animation within lo local newsrooms. So the challenge that we saw is that the reliance on words excludes some audiences. It speaks to exactly some of the points that some of my cohort have already mentioned today. Subtitles can help overcome language barriers, but often not for those facing literacy difficulties. And what we've seen through our own experience in making animation over a number of years is that animations can stand alone in communicating critical information. They can also quickly and inexpensively incorporate multiple translations they're really versatile in getting information to a broader range of audiences as possible and I think what we what we've really seen through our own experience is rather than approaching it as having a product and then finding different ways to make that product accessible by layering on um, translations or subtitles actually reverse engineering and starting it from a place where you're building a product that is as inclusive as possible and then finding ways to make it even more inclusive what we recognize through the course of our own experience in developing animations but also through our engagement in the early part of this project was that 
local media organizations already recognize the importance of reaching these underrepresented groups. You know, we're preaching to the choir here. It's not that there isn't an, an, an acknowledgement of the need for the content to be more inclusive. It just typically will come back to resources. Creating this specific content can be expensive and often just outside of the reach of local um, newsrooms, especially um, at, at the pace or at the speed that you might need. Um, content on a particular topic. Um, so how did we think we could work towards a solution? What we've been working on over the course of the past nine to 12 months is a collaborative model that facilitates the production and sharing of animated content and campaign campaigns with view to providing newsrooms with free or low cost animated content on a range of topical themes. Um, and by that, really the reach is, is extremely broad. Um, it could be about healthcare, it could be about disaster preparedness, it could be about specific services. There are some topics that lend themselves well to animation. There are others that it's very challenging to tell that visual story. For example, we've wrestled with voter registration for a long time. It's very difficult to communicate about that visually, but that doesn't mean that there aren't 99% of other topics where with creativity and innovation, you can really find different ways to communicate that information. And what we've really been working on over the last, um, last six to 12 months is, is thinking about ways in which we can make that content really adaptable for newsrooms so that you can take the core content that's created collectively and then you build it in a way that a newsroom can add a frame at the end with specific information relevant to the community that they serve. It might be local organizations that somebody could contact within that city or, or that region. It might be a specific language version because that is the community that they're specifically working to target and by adding um, a translated version to a visual that's already been created with a really inexpensively create really high quality content that targets a particular community that they're working to serve. Ultimately, what we're working towards is establishing a sustainable cost sharing model by leveraging the economies of scale here. And this project is the first step in finding a way in which that model can become something that can be replicated. So what have we been actually doing? Um, we've consulted with newsrooms across the US um, and really East Coast to West Coast, various places in between. Some have been smaller newsrooms, some have had more of a national reach. What's been interesting in those conversations is that whereas we came in to the project, particularly thinking about it from the point of view of overcoming language and literacy barriers, the newsrooms that we talked to saw the reach being much wider. Um, there were, um, for example, examples where they saw the potential in using animation to reach specific age groups, for example, elderly, that people who didn't want to read a huge volume of content or needed an accessible way to access information, but also young people who are consuming that information in a different way. Um, they, that, that kind of links closely to newsrooms who are trying to be really innovative in how they are operating in the virtual space. Newsrooms that mentioned they were finding ways to reach people via text, via social media, but needing kind of easily accessible visual content. And they really saw the opportunities in animation um, to be able to enhance the quality of the content that they were sharing. And then also really, accessible entry points for more complex content. Um, we had newsrooms and organizations that had more investigative um, stories where they couldn't see someone automatically accessing a 5,000 word story. But if there was a way, if there was an entry point that could draw someone in, um, finding innovative and new ways to do that. So that was interesting for us because we had come into this project with, with a certain kind of expectation of the underserved communities we were um, targeting and it actually become, became much broader. Um, we identified a couple, um, some priority themes that we could make some animations on in order for this collaborative approach to be tested. Um, 
These were disaster preparedness, uh, mental health, accessing support for domestic violence, information about online safety, including preventing phishing and password security, and then something a bit more in the lifestyle space around parenting and, and using animation in a more lighthearted way to reach people on, on different kinds of topics. We've now created that animated content. Um, it will be available in our website very soon um, for people to browse, look at, and, and then available for them to use um, as, they see, as they see fit. Um, it's, we want it to be a really inclusive um, and accessible res resource for newsrooms across the country. So what's the product? Um, as I mentioned, we've created a website that we're in the process of ironing out some kinks, but the idea being that that being a place where local newsrooms can go and browse the content that's already available, they can request existed anim animated content for them to use um, within their own reporting. And they can also access guidance on how animation can be incorporated into their reporting and, and things like th things about where it works and where it's more challenging. We can also offer support in tailoring those animations to the local newsroom. So although it may be um, co collectively created content, you, how you can make it your own by adding a logo, adding some local information, um, creating a particular translation if there's a particular audience that you're targeting. Those are all things that we um, can support um, newsrooms in particularly while we continue to advance this testing phase and but then long term we one moment we really do want to find ways to make um, to really show the potential and um, the opportunities that animation offers. So we would love people who are interested in, in experimenting and testing some of this content within their newsrooms to get in touch. You'll join a kind of collaborative group. We're very mindful that um, people are time poor. It's not something that they can spend a lot of time and we really try to be respectful of that as we've been going through the process is, is we want this to be a way to take the burden off newsrooms and give them access to high quality content without it creating additional work. And so um, we're really keen to provide a space where we can um, collaborate, we can find ways of identifying common themes in terms of the needs on the type of themes where animations will be helpful. And then in the coming months, as well as testing the content that we already have, we'll also be creating new content. And so there's the opportunity to highlight themes where you feel it would be um, really valuable. Um, some of the things that we've had, um, it, obviously, there's a, a huge interest around health um, continuing um, around the, the pandemic and COVID. I, that may have passed now, but I think what it's revealed is the value in, in that, this kind of medium in, in communicating about health and mental health. Um, but there really are so many ideas that we've had shared with us. And so we really would appreciate feedback and engagement, but know that over the coming weeks, that content is available to newsrooms to experiment with. And we're really keen to continue learning from you around where you see this being applied in practice. I have my email at the bottom there, um, liz at rippleeffectimages.org. Over the coming weeks, we'll also be activating an email address dedicated to the Simply No Words um, collaboration. Um, and we'll be sure to share that in the, um, in the final materials when they go out from our JI. Thanks, Kat. All right, thank you, Liz. And Kate, you're up next. Hi there, um, I'm just sharing one sec. Um, my name's Kate Abby Lamberts. Um, I am the co-founder of Detour Detroit, a local news startup um, really focused on newsletters and reader engagement. Um, as of this week, we are actually um, officially joining Outlier Media, so you can find me there from now on as a product and engagement manager. Um, for my project, um, I uh, built a real estate development tracker for Detroit, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Um, this project came about, um, 
my slides. Um, when a reader, uh, Jimmy McBroom, um, responded to a reader survey um, asking about coverage areas that people wanted to see more of in the real estate development and housing sphere. He had this project he had started working on a little bit um, with through his role in the city's open data portal. And that project um, was scrapped a few years ago. And he said, hey, I started this thing. Um, maybe we could work on it together. Um, and that was the genesis of this real estate development tracker, um, which I used to apply to RJI, um, in, whenever that was, um, in 2020. And um, in July, we started working on this in earnest. Um, so the development tracker is functions like a news app. It lives on the Detour Detroit site right now. And you can use it to look up information like ownership and timelines and photos of real estate developments near you or anywhere in the city. Um, the reason we were so um, convinced that this was a useful project to build is the really the, the pace of real estate development and the influx of money and changes in Detroit, um, particularly since the municipal bankruptcy has really just skyrocketed. And it's really difficult to, to keep track of as a journalist and for a resident who has way many more things to pay attention to even more so. And so huge or, or medium developments can go up in your neighborhood um, in areas where there have been a lot of disinvestment um, and a lot of vacancy and maybe not much changes for good or for bad um, really fast before you've had a time to comment or, or share an opinion. And issues of displacement um, and gentrification are really uh, top of mind um, for me as a journalist and for a lot of residents. So being able to easily see what's happening around you and potentially how you can get involved in it in some way or find more information or go to a public meeting um, was the impetus for this project. Um, as well, we were really excited about the idea of bringing readers in to help us. Um, it's a large city and uh, there are a lot of little projects. We didn't really wanna focus on just downtown, just the few you know, multi-million dollar projects, but um, smaller neighborhood led development. Um, and so um, making it easy and um, encouraged for readers to submit their tips about what they see or what they wanna know more about was kind of a core piece of the project. Um, and then at the end and kind of the, the final piece I'll show you is trying to figure out how to make this something that um, other local newsrooms like ours, fairly small, um, fairly resource strapped could do something similar um, and provide a resource if their communities need it um, and if it matches their organization's mission. Um, so we started um, with this Airtable base that, that Jimmy had created originally, uh, you know, four years ago or whatever it was, with just a few records. And we looked at how we could transform that into a data structure um, that would, that would, um, in the right field, yes, that would work for the kinds of data we wanted to collect and could collect and made sense um, as journalists. And, you know, then we had to start figuring out how we were going to do that. There were many things that I had hoped we would be able to find ways to kind of automatically pull in or find other databases that we could um, pull from in some way. And so far we've not had much success from for that. So most of what we did um, was manual data entry, um, save one piece um, where we pulled from the open data portal um, information about property uh, zoning and uh, taxpayer information. So we've got all these records in here, pretty boring to look at as a database, um, but with Airtable easily able to kind of do these different kinds of data structures and then link to the other um, sources of information that we have. And the Airtable is basically the CMS for our website. Um, I think that's where we are now. So this is the Detroit Development Tracker. This was published in just exactly a month ago. Um, it's very simple. We would love to add more features and more functions and more data, um, but 
we wanted to get it in front of people first and see how they were using it and what pieces we should expand on. Um, so you can explore the map, scroll in and scroll even further and actually see the projects that are in the map. Um, you can click on them. I'll, I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, on the projects page, you can search for anything. Um, Dan Gilbert uh, is a large developer, although I think we call, we go by Bedrock is the name of it. I can't type. And then you can click on any of these projects. I'm seeing a typo here. Um, but yeah, you can see the, the build type, the status, the different uses, um, a short description. This is the zoning information, the taxpayer information, um, parcel information from the city, and this map. What does it look like if we have photos? And then tell us what you know about this project. What do you see? This, fee, this, this form appears on every um, project and then also it lives as its own page and for anyone to submit anything that they see. And this is the piece that I was most excited and also apprehensive about uh, not knowing to what degree there would be appetite or willingness to get involved with this or how much people were you know, paying attention in a way that they could remember and, and write down these things. Um, but we were pleasantly surprised um, we've gotten 120 plus tips in the four weeks since we launched, um, not three, the four weeks since we launched, um, and those are not all, some of them definitely came from the same person. We don't ask for contact information, um, required, so people don't have to, but every single one was a legitimate tip. We haven't gotten any spam or anything that, um, wouldn't potentially be a tip that would be useful. Some of it um, involved projects that we had already um, have in our kind of backlog already and people beat us to the punch of telling us um, that we need to get them in there. Um, we have 180 or so published and another 50 or 60 in the backlog to vet or edit um, or um, do a little bit more additional reporting on. When people add tips, they come in to our Airtable in a separate table um, and they are linked to the project that they commented on if they if it was and they can add photos and then I can go through and assign this to a record and assign it to um, a reporter or an editor to vet it and then add it to our table and republish. Um, that's how that process works um, and we're I'm going over time so just finally, I will share the next thing that we did was, um, and we just started after we launched, so it's only been a month that we've been working on it and it will be public in a few weeks, um, but we turned it into a template website that is very similar styling to the one that we did, some even simpler stuff, um, some, some styling stripped out um, with all of these, there's about 10 projects in here as samples, but it's designed so you can use this guide, um, follow all the instructions of which there are many. There's some accounts you have to have, but we walk you through um, each of those things. So you can set up your own Airtable base by copying ours using your own data, and then you can connect it to a website, build it out, customize it, and publish it on your own newsroom's site. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So I know we only have a few minutes left um, and there are a ton of questions. So we'll try to go through a few of these and then we'll um, see if the fellows can go through and answer some of your questions in the doc for you later. Um, so the first one is for Emma. Someone asked what influenced your decision to include managers in the program and what is the next step for your cohort? Sure, so I think that I've seen and taught in other leadership programs that didn't involve the direct manager or an executive sponsor and found that 
you often end up sending really talented people back to their newsrooms who are like real excited about their jobs and, and their plan. And then their manager isn't on board with like giving them short assignments or helping them move forward. And so it was really important for me that the host newsroom was putting forth some resources as well. And then for the current cohort, they've got one month left um, with me and, and then we'll close out with their, um, one, of the, one of the tweaks that we're making is we're gonna have a close out meeting with their core team. So me, their manager, their sponsor, um, and the, the fellow will kind of set up their next steps. And someone asked, have you had any hesitation from managers um, to provide the needed resources? We haven't, but I also haven't like spoken to some of the supervisors recently. So, you know, I don't think, I think that, you know, if they were all given homework to go review the like growth opportunities um, presentation that I gave to the fellows. Uh, and so that was like their homework. So hopefully they're all doing that right now and it's going super awesomely. So another question, uh, CC. Someone asked, what do you hope is next for the DEI coalition after this project? Yeah, so um, I have a version of the answer in there, which I'm now not gonna follow when I say it all out. But um, basically uh, I'm really excited. Um, next Tuesday is technically our one year anniversary. And um, after this project, I'm really prepping for the launch of what we're gonna do in year two. And um, there will be more details of that on Tuesday, but I'll say this, which is year one was really focused on getting to know each other, our challenges, what's going on, the individual things that people wanna talk about and work through. Year two, I'm going to try to lead an effort um, similar in structure to what we did in building the coalition as over a hundred people. Year two, I'm trying to lead an effort that is really, um, the, the purpose is to result in some sort of collective action. So whether it's all small actions we can each take in our own newsrooms across the entire industry or something very specific that affects all of us in the same way um, in which we can call on uh, for you know very concrete change. So more on that on Tuesday. Great, thank you so much. And Hannah, this is one for you. Um, I see you have a bunch of them, but when does it make sense to ask a reader source or staff member about their status and needs? I think that in general, providing space to have someone self-identify is really important in this way. Um, when it comes to sources, I typically say, what format for an interview makes you most comfortable? Um, or like giving someone the room to say, I really prefer to conduct this over the phone or over a video meeting, uh, and that could be because of, um, like for myself, like they're immunocompromised and they don't wanna have other people in their space or they might be deaf and they may prefer to use um, closed captioning on a Google video. Um, just a plug here, Zoom is not inherently very accessible. You have to have an extra plugin and pay to have closed captioning. So I really prefer to use Google Hangouts because it is just available in a much wider sense for folks. Um, and then for colleagues, like um, I talk in, I'll have, I have a section in the toolkit about offering um, clear instructions or like making it part of the onboarding about how to request an ADA accommodation and what that process looks like. Um, and also um, I really advocate for companies to have um, a disability ERG. Um, we just started one at McClatchy. They have one at the New York Times that gives both employees and allies a space to feel supported and to collectively um, advocate for their needs as employees within the company. So thank you. Great, thank you. So as we're coming up on the hour, um, we will wrap up there, but please feel free to look at the Google Doc. Um, some of the fellows have already answered some of the questions we haven't gotten to today. I'm recording this, so I will share the recording and link to it in the Google Doc as well and email it out to everybody just in case you were not able to attend today. I was just reading a comment. Thank you, Kate. I'm sure they all appreciate that. Um, you guys have been getting lots of kudos in the chat, so I hope you have been able to watch it. And if anybody else has questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to put you in touch with the fellows, answer questions. 
um, link to their resources when they're released. So someone in the Google Doc did ask, where is that template, Kate? They want it right now. Um, so not all these resources are currently live, but they will be released in the next couple of weeks. So please stay tuned. I will email them out to everybody who registered to this session, and we will be sharing it widely on social. And if you are here today learning about the fellows because you are interested in an RJI fellowship, our deadline is March 25th. So it's coming up. So please do apply. Um, you know, don't get in your own way. Please apply for the fellowship. We love to read about your ideas and talk to you about them. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly as well. My contact info is in the doc. I'm happy to chat one-on-one -on -one with anyone who's interested in building a wonderful resource like these fellows did. All right, so thank you so much, everybody, for your time, your comments, and your feedback. Fellows, thank you so much for your wonderful work. Um, your projects are amazing, and I'm so excited to get to see them used out in the world in newsrooms all over the country. Have a great week, everybody.